Kyle Sondland and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Security Token Show, Episode 12. My name is Kyle Sondland, and I'm joined, as always, with my co-host, Herwig. This is Herwig Koning speaking. Always a pleasure to be here, Kyle. Very excited for this week's episode. Tokenized sports contracts is the discussion of this week's episode. Pretty exciting. Big deal. Very cool. It's coming off of some interesting news. But before we get into that, I do want to stress something, highlight an initiative that Kyle and I have been working on for some time now. Specifically, it's in regards to giving feedback to the SEC because recently they requested the public to give their comments on 19 different questions regarding improving the U.S. private exemptions framework. This includes things like questions around the accredited investor definition, improving Reg A+, Reg CF, and other things. We've gone ahead and done a very detailed response. You can go ahead and check it out on our Medium channel, medium.com slash security token group. And if you like what we're saying, we really ask you to take a minute and sign a letter so that you can show your support, voice your opinion, and collectively we can show the SEC that we are thinking like a unified industry, that we all advocate for these changes, and that we hope that they're listening to us. So please, please go check that out. But as always, let's get into the show, Kyle. Let's start with the news. Starting off with some pretty cool news, as always. We try to go for the the big institutional stuff first. And this week, without a doubt, I think it's absolutely the fact that Santander, a massive Spanish banking giant, settled both sides of a 20 million bond trade on Ethereum. Now, this this is important because... Not only are they claiming that they're the first institution to use a public blockchain to manage all aspects of a bond issuance, um, but the company not only used a token on Ethereum to represent that $20 million bond, Kyle, but they settled it with another set of ERC-20 tokens representing cash held in a custody account. This is way better than some of the other test bond settlements on the blockchain have occurred because it's one thing to have the security represented digitally or via a token. It's another to then settle that and cash it back out. And if you're working with an analog system where you have to somehow manage to, to cash out through a very analog system, then uh, it's not going to work that well. It's much more complicated. The cost efficiencies that you're seeing from using blockchain dwindle dramatically, maybe becomes even redundant or not effective. So I think Santander really did it right. They, they managed to do a full on-chain bond issuance uh, all the way through and through. The only thing is that it was not including any outside investors. So this was a little bit more of an R&D play and therefore also very controlled and very manageable. But I think the fact that they have managed to do it successfully is a positive sign for the industry. In fact, Santander themselves said that at the bank, they're not interested in cryptocurrencies. They don't intend to support Bitcoin or Ethereum or other assets. The technology is the same underneath, they say, but they're interested in the customers that are interested in traditional dollars, euros, pounds being tokenized. And so that's what they're getting into. That's how they're leveraging it. Um, So we have a lot of exciting things to come from there. That's definitely a really big move. I think you're right in in identifying that this really does seem more like a a test for them more than anything. Obviously, even just looking at the $20 million debt issuance, I mean, that that is a drop in the bucket for for a large bank like Santander. But it's very interesting to see, as you mentioned, that they're they're using both ends of the spectrum in terms of using these ERC-20 tokens. And so... When you have an analog cash out method, the real issue there is needing to find an OTC house that can then cash your Ethereum or crypto token back into fiat currencies. And so instead of of leveraging or relying on outside providers to handle that, especially because Santander does not want to necessarily do that themselves, it's, it's crucial for them in this process to leverage the token all the way through and then to do it with one currency in, in a traditional conversion method 
later. But if they if they pay out all of their different bonds and all of their different currencies, it, it just is not going to be very efficient. They're going to lose a lot of, of the benefits of leveraging a, a international currency that can be used in this method. But I think that it's fantastic. This is definitely a huge step in that direction. And it's another bank that's exploring how these blockchain technologies can be implemented inside the financial sector in, in a real institutional way. And so we've seen this many times before in the podcast. We've referenced many other banks exploring this opportunity. Santander is just another huge one that's interested. And, and this is the first time that we've really seen it all the way through and, and, and a successful test operation. So because of that, I'm actually going to be naming Santander my company of the week, Herwig. We're starting off early here. Um, and and I just, I'm just i excited to see if they actually you know, move forward with this and provide you know, blockchain-based fixed income securities to outside investors. We'll have to see um, whether they, you know, build their own kind of private blockchain out of this or whether they leverage, you know, one of the, the many institutional options that are currently available. A lot of that will be will be still left up to be addressed and, and we'll keep you updated here. But but very, very cool stuff. I think what you're getting at there is using a stable coin in this situation to, you know, manage this process dramatically easier. It'll be interesting to see if they develop their own, maybe use JPM, JPM coin, coin, man. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's a lot of other stuff out there too that's coming. So again, we're starting to see banks really leverage this technology and now we're seeing it through and through. Moving on, a little news about Bank to the Future, a well-known crowdfunding platform focused on cryptocurrency companies and blockchain companies. They are bullish, Kyle, on security tokens with a focus on rolling out, actually investing and partnering with Diacle, a cryptocurrency advisory firm to basically develop their own STO expertise and, and advisory for the Bank to the Future platform, which will be rolling out STOs. They're based out of the Cayman Islands and, and have done a lot of success to date already. I think something like 800 million in, in funds raised through the platform. Mm -hmm. They claim to have 87,000 institutional investors waiting and excited for these new types of offerings, Kyle. So if Bank to the Future starts rolling out some STOs, it looks like they already have an existing base that, that they can target. Uh, and I'd be very interested to see how some of those first STOs roll out. They have had such success in the past that I hope that they can do good for this industry and start to bring STOs to the forefront as well. Broker-dealers are really still needed in the space in terms of introducing traditional investors into the industry. Because the reality is that, that while security tokens pose so many great benefits, it is still a very niche industry. And, and many investors are just aren't aware of these offerings and maybe participating in equity crowdfunding or maybe participating in some sort of crypto or interested in that space, but may not know how to actually connect with the right investments, may not know how to properly do that. So if they have a lot of these institutional investors, even if they've just participated in equity crowdfunding before, it's not a tremendous jump to go from, from that kind of a, a methodology to participate in security tokens. You certainly would hope that, that, that a large portion or, or some significant number of those investors are, are going to be interested in looking at some of these deals. And if we can get some of these security tokens funded, I think that that's going to be great for the industry to, to really get some real high quality assets you know, with liquidity on secondary markets. Given that they are focused on cryptocurrency originally, I think they see themselves a lot as bridging that community to the STO concept. But I do know that according to their article that they are also looking at you know, institutions themselves and seeing you know, attacking it from the other side of the market too. So great stuff. We always love to see that. We're their biggest cheerleaders. And you know, it's always good to see more and more STOs happening. Definitely. And speaking of more and more STOs happening, T0 has partnered up with Blockflix, which is an entertainment financing company. Uh, Blockflix is a media finance and advisory firm that provides many major studio producers and independent producers with comprehensive financing solutions to fund the production of films, television programming, and digital online content. To date, the company's management has financed or co-financed 30 entertainment projects, and they've officially partnered with T-Zero, as well as Jumpstart Securities as their placement agent to go ahead and start offering you know, tokenized uh, financing opportunities here in the digital media and financing space. And this is not news for, for T0 either per se, because we know a couple months back in July, they announced that they're tokenizing the Atari Fistful of Quarters movie or documentary, I think, about uh, Nolan Bushnell, who founded Atari, obviously. So T0 is clearly bullish on the concept of tokenized uh, finance and media. 
Uh, and I think we're going to see just a lot more of this happen in general, not just through T0 and, and Block Flicks, but I think we, we've seen a lot of other projects that you've mentioned before in the past. So I think it's really cool that we're, we're seeing a push around this. Again, it remains to be seen how successful these offerings are, but at the very least, BlockFlix looks to be focused on more of a niche segment of production opportunities than, say, the big block AAA, you know, big blockbuster uh, movies. So, again, really interesting that T-Zero seems to have a specific focus, at the very least, around media finance. Something worth following, for sure. Moving on, Harbor has successfully launched and uh, tokenized four real estate funds, combined worth around $100 million worth of those shares. And the move is intended to make these private securities easier to trade for the 1,100 investors that hold them, along with 17 brokers and 17 placement agents that work with the fund managers, according to ICAP Equity. In fact, the ICAP Equity CEO, Chris Christensen, says, for years we've been looking for ways to create the best investment experience we can, we can and for us, that means providing liquidity. So this is enormous to me because you have an existing marketplace or an existing network of investors interested in real estate and a fund manager that has you know, positioned themselves and created a platform to help facilitate access to these investments and, and managing them. And now, of course, one of these major issues has always been getting early liquidity or some partial liquidity because most of the time when you invest in funds like this, not only is there a regulatory one-year lockup, but more commonly they put in their own lockup requirements ranging from three to five years before you can exit a real estate project. Not uncommon because just like with startups and many other things, these things take time to build and develop and start to monetize. So they don't want you to have to, to cash out early, but of course, Liquidity is beneficial in all accounts and, and not only are not is not always does make it sense for you to be able to hold on three to five years. So this early liquidity component has been a big need for them clearly. And I imagine that it's a, a need for many fund managers and existing marketplaces and networks where it's not about selling offerings and, and finding new investors. It's about improving the processes and efficiencies in the current network and marketplace. So that's why I'm actually going to give ICAP Equity, the fund manager in this situation, my company of the week for making this move and being a, you know, a spotlight to other fund managers to hopefully do the same thing. In this case, they've chosen Harbor, which is a notable and reputable tokenization platform out of uh, San Francisco. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some news around how they're going to continue to, to leverage the technology. Maybe they can make a case study. That would be great. Uh, I know the customers and their investors are certainly going to enjoy the, the new experience, I'm sure. Moving on, we have the Financial Market Authority out of Liechtenstein issuing a statement on the LCX AG crypto platform exchange. Specifically, it was a notice by the FMA saying, you know, just to be clear, that is essentially the SEC equivalent out of Liechtenstein. And they basically are pointing out that LCX AG is not currently licensed to offer any financial services, services that are governed by the FMA. So we know that this same exchange has announced interest into moving into the security token space. And it seems like the regulator is making it very clear that they are not yet actively approved to do any such services. Maybe they're also commenting on some of the other activities that they're up to on the cryptocurrency side. It's not very clear. But they do acknowledge the fact that the company has applied for the OTF, MTF license under the MIFID II to comply and actually properly participate and, and start offering financial services that they cover. So... If you're investing on that exchange or doing something with it, make sure that I guess uh, they're checking out and we'll see if this causes any problems or, or causes anything to occur within the exchange. We'll certainly follow up on it in the coming weeks. As always, do your own research. When you're working with any financial services provider or any exchange or really when you're giving your money to anybody, make sure that they're reputable, make sure that they have the licenses and that they say they do and, and just be smart. And, and so LCX is, is working on it. They're, they're applying for those licenses. And so we, we wish them the best of luck in, in passing those and getting the certifications that they need so that they can support the security token ecosystem. And uh, for investors, make sure that, that you're being smart about who you're working with. Right on, Kyle, totally agree. The same regulator, FMA, 
uh, actually gave the nod to New Fund recently to go ahead and start launching offerings. New Fund is another issuance platform, I believe, out of Germany. They are. Um, and yeah, they're they're looking to start finally launching more offerings. They had already raised some money themselves before, and I know Kyle's going to give us the scoop on uh, what they've got loaded for us. Yep, they got one coming, so we'll talk about that later. Polymath really recently came up with a Polymesh update here in September, submitted by Token Will, new user. Welcome to the community, Token Will. I have a, a funny feeling that I think I know who you are, but again, we always welcome everybody and encourage people to submit their content. In this case, the update is pretty uh, consistent. It's in a video format, about 30 minutes, so you can check it out on YouTube. As always, all the news articles that I'm talking about are available in the description from wherever you're listening to this podcast, so you can go check out the, the content afterwards. They're also on stomarket.com slash news. That's where we source all of our content originally, so if you have articles you'd like to submit, definitely post them there. But I will give you the breakdown for the Polymesh update here. It started off with Trevor Coverco, one of the co-founders of Polymath, offering some insights as to why they need Polymash, you know, specifically focusing on the need for a dedicated blockchain for compliance purposes. Ethereum was a great choice at the time. It was had distribution. It was the one that had the most uh, um, progress in the industry, and it made sense for them to partner. But ultimately, they recognized the need for a specific dedicated blockchain for securities. This followed by uh, an update of their, I believe their CTO or their head of the architecture giving a pretty technical analysis on all these changes and improvements as to why the Polymesh platform is going to be better than using Ethereum. And they also noted, which I think is something we've discussed before, Kyle, you know, the, the fact that they're going to offer seamless migration over to the Polymesh platform. So if you're using their Ethereum platform today, you'll have no concerns or no worries about migrating over to Polymesh when that actually launches, which is expected to be in sometime 2020 and Q2. So, you know, that, that's good news because that has sometimes been a little conflicting. I think this update has done a lot to create some clarity about, you know, first of all, the need for moving to and creating the Polymesh platform, the advantages of it, and also how that's going to affect their current state of, of business. So I know, I know, Kyle, for you, for sure, uh, this is this is a good update. Yeah, well done from the Polymath team. This is exactly what you're looking for, you know, for, as an outsider. I think the reality is that showing awareness and being conscious of all of these different pieces and, and how they all fit together, I think that shows that they have a good plan and that they know the direction that they're headed. We weren't sure whether these were being developed separately or in conjunction. And so what we're seeing here is that they are being developed in conjunction and it's a clear transition from one to another. So. Well done to them. I look forward to seeing um, that Q2 2020 deadline, and we'll see how that goes. I certainly know that tech seems, seems to always be delayed. So hopefully for them, it's certainly from my personal experience at least, uh, so hopefully for them that they can get it out on time and they can, they can leverage that and, and be incredibly successful in scaling their solution to all of their clients. I hope so. Me too. The, the test net was expected around that time, so we'll, we'll certainly sure, surely get a lot of updates. I know there's a lot of excitement behind this project. You had one of the co-founders of Ethereum and Cardano uh, help co-architect this platform, and there's just simply, you know, Polymath is one of those big names in this space that, that took a lot of attention to create for digital securities and tokenized securities. So super exciting to, to see this come out in the near future. You better believe that we will be covering it in 2020. This podcast isn't going anywhere. We are the Our longest biggest. running podcast here in the space, and we plan to keep that title. So look, for, look out for episode uh, 120, where we talk about the live Polymesh testnet. Let's, let's hope that's the case. Finally, the last piece of news I have for us here is TokenSoft announcing security token support for transfer agents. So they have developed, developed you know, a suite of services and specific support technology designed around transfer agents, recognizing their importance and their role in the industry, both from a traditional point of view as well as for the future of tokenized securities and security tokens. Uh, and, you know, I think this is great because most recently we saw Securitize themselves become a transfer agent and we did a whole episode talking about the need for a transfer agent, more important for public companies, but there's still a need for them in the private markets. And it only makes sense that some of these issuance platforms and specialist firms like Tokensoft 
start to cater towards the transfer agents themselves because just like we saw with the, the Harbor deal with ICAP, these, are, these transfer agents have existing clients, existing networks, existing infrastructure that can benefit from blockchain technology, make their processes more efficient and more cost effective and create a better user experience for their clients. So I think it's great to see TokenSoft take more of a generalist approach to support all transfer agents. And I think that's clear sign from our previous episode, Kyle, that there is you know, more emphasis now around transfer agents. It'll be interesting to see if some of the issuance platforms decide to do something like TokenSoft and start to, to partner up with, with some existing ones, or if they pull a securitize and start getting transfer agent licenses themselves. Very interesting. As Herwig said, if you're interested in learning more about transfer agents, definitely check out our last episode in which we really take a deep dive into what that means and how they can be incredibly effective for security tokens. And uh, we went into pretty good detail. So definitely go check that out. And good on TokenSoft. They, they've now launched a couple of different features to assist with the more compliance and legal-based processes of really what it means to be a security token and how these assets are transferred and, and registered. And so they're doing a great job in terms of doing a lot of the dirty work that, that certainly I think you and I aren't quite as familiar with. So good work from TokenSoft. I agree, Kyle. Uh, I think they're doing great work. And that's all the news I have. I'm ready to pass it over to you and hear about the latest deals and offerings. Yeah. So let's dive right into it, into the security token offering news. The first one is from Merge, which is an international security token exchange based out of Seychelles. We've mentioned them multiple times here on the podcast, and they actually are now going live with their IPO equity security token offering. So the Merge exchange is IPOing. They're going public with their equity in the form of a security token. And so it's a great move for them to be able to do this. They're targeting $4 million, which we've talked about is something that we see, seems reasonable for them to, to, to reach that mark. And, and it seems like a reasonable amount of money that they might need to make this, you know, to scale this operation. From my observations, it seems like they've raised around $320,000 so far. So they're, they're well on their way to successfully completing that raise. We wish them the best of luck. If you're interested in participating, definitely go check out their site, merge.exchange, and you can see more info about that offering and about their, their security token exchange. And that actually reminds me, I did actually just post an article through our Medium that details all of the security token exchanges that I was able to find through all of my research in the industry. We were able to identify, Herwig and I, about 43 to 45 exchanges somewhere in there that we're actually going to be updating every week or every month whenever we can find more information about additional exchanges. We will keep that document updated. We, we mentioned a lot of them on uh, episode a few weeks ago on international security tokens and we mentioned that we were going to be coming out with this big list so definitely go check that out it's all over our twitters um, as well as the medium channel definitely go check out our security token exchanges all around the world if you're interested in staying up to date on one near you moving forward into the dwell owner security token dwell owner is a real estate brokerage firm that is tokenizing their equity and so Herwig, you've mentioned not only today, but we, we've heard a few times now that there are some serious institutional real estate funds that are looking into you know, tokenizing and, and participating in the security token space. We know that real estate is a fantastic use case that, that many issuance platforms have targeted as a successful opportunity for fundraise. But we've also heard from the other side that, that real estate brokers are, are really identifying with the security token opportunities to be able to participate in, in buying and actually selling homes and the rights to the home instead of just as an investment opportunity. And this one does sound interesting, Kyle, because you mentioned they are a real estate brokerage firm tokenizing their equity. So it's not a fund, it's not a REIT, it's not a specific property that you're investing in. You're talking about a, a real estate brokerage firm that actually makes money on brokering these different real estate deals regardless of whether they're tokenized or not. And now you can get access via equity, which I think is unique. I'm not sure how often people every day can access a real estate brokerage firm to invest in. Exactly, exactly. So they're trying to kind of democratize that process of buying and selling homes. And, and so their target raise is $7 million. And they have 
already announced a partnership with Open Finance Network, so potentially they're looking to pave a path to liquidity, or as we'll get to later, potentially lack thereof. But regardless, uh, if you're interested in participating in a real estate brokerage firm and, and really supporting their efforts, uh, definitely go check out Dwell Owner, the security token offering. Links are in the description as always. Moving forward into another security token we have. We mentioned this company before. They were a former company of the week from myself. And this is Fintelum. Fintelum is an issuance platform based out of the EU. And they're doing a security token offering for their own equity as well. They have a white paper on their site. And I, I did my best to skim through that. But I wasn't able to find many details on the exact structuring of the offering. It doesn't seem like it's being heavily promoted yet, so maybe they're still, they're still ironing out some details or, or whatever they're working on. Um, but we'll be in touch with their team and see if we can find out more information on that one. And I definitely will give you more updates. But Fintelum is conducting a security token out of the EU. I remember, I think you made them the company of the week for the, a report that they had published on some research on security tokens. So... Very cool to see them making waves again now doing their own offering. Uh, I guess maybe we'll learn more about it as they proceed. Definitely. Definitely. We'll keep you updated. Moving forward into Smartlands. Smartlands is another company that, that has really been making some, some great moves recently with a very successful real estate token offering that fully sold out in the UK, as well as a, another fund that, that we announced last week that they're, they're also now going to be fund or, you know issuing for... And this week, we actually have news that they themselves are going to raise capital for their own issuance platform and scale that process by tokenizing their holding company. And so they, they clearly have a lot of investor interest. It seems like their offerings have been very successful thus far. So they're looking to scale that operation and, and keep the positive momentum going so they can continue to do that moving forward. So I looked into it as much as I could. Again, couldn't find a ton of structuring information, but I did find that it says that for all inquiries concerning the opportunity to invest in Smartlands holding, please contact venture at smartlands.io. So if you're interested in this, this offering, it's a successful issuance platform that's been really making some, some big moves. It's an up and coming company. Go check it out, venture at smartlands.io. Shoot them an email. I think they were also company of the week. Uh, if I remember correctly. They were my company of the week two That's weeks right. ago. So now you have two companies of the week that you can invest in. That's pretty cool. I would check those offerings out if you're interested in the space, people. So as always, not investment advice, but great companies that are doing great things. And we're, we're proud to see them keeping the positive momentum going. Um, shout out to those guys and girls. Finally, we have an update on New Fund. Herwig, you mentioned New Fund earlier, and, and they are a, going live with their first security token offering through their platform that is, is now regulated and approved. And New Fund is issuing a, a security token called Grape, G-R-E-Y-P. I, I almost thought it was Gray P. It's Grape. And Grape is an electric bicycle technology company. And so they're building these, these really interesting bicycles that have tech involved that you kind of plug your phone into it and it gives you all kind of analytics and, and all this great stuff. I'm certainly not a cyclist myself, but it was, it was a very interesting diagram in the videos and everything that I saw from their platform. And so they're actually launching a security token from via the new fund platform. It's available to all retail investors in Europe. It's only accredited here in the USA, which seems to be a pretty common trait with the USA being slightly more restrictive than, than what we've seen in the European jurisdiction thus far. But you know, retail investors can invest as little as 10 euros in this offering. So this is a true crowdfunding you know, opportunity here. Um, and you know, they, as you had found actually, they're backed by Porsche, T-Mobile, and Camel Group. So they've got some serious players behind them, supporting them. They're doing a you know a security token that, that seems to be very affordable for, for people that want to throw you know a couple bucks in here or there and, and be able to participate in, in a true crowdfunding fashion. And so that whitelist opens in seven days that they'll they'll I guess begin to onboard some investors or gauge potential interest. And at that point, I'm sure we will find out more information on the structuring of that deal. But if you're interested in in, in, in you know checking out an offering that, that is backed by some serious 
some serious firepower. I mean, when you're looking at Porsche is a very forward thinking automotive company. This is a forward thinking, you know, bicycle transportation company. So there definitely seems to be some synergies there. So if you're interested, definitely go check that out. It's great. G E G R E Y P. Electric bikes, they're a trend that I don't see going down at all. You know, I've been on a few and now you have a lot of these companies like Uber and, and others that are bringing out mobile transportation in the, the last mile, if you will. And so this could be a very timely offering. I'm definitely going to keep my eyes on it. I think you can access the whitelist in seven days. Yes. Yep. Yep. So check it out and, and do your research. And then if you're interested, come back in a week. And uh, middle of September, you should be able to do that, or I guess a week from now. So, Finally, we've got the market update. So this is talking about some of our live security tokens that we've been able to track around the world. And, and hopefully, as these continue to scale, we can give a, a dedicate more of our time to it. Until then, we really only are addressing the T0 exchange. T0, the token price, we like to identify that. It is available to retail investors here in the United States, as well as I believe they're onboarding international investors or they're working on that at this point. Certainly all investors here in the US can participate in the secondary trading of the T0 equity token. And so the T0 token price is at around $3 today, which is significantly higher than what we were seeing last week. I mean. Obviously, the token doesn't have a ton of volume. It's, it's about $13,000 in trading volume today. They're looking at, they're averaging around $50,000 a week, which is okay. It's certainly better than, it's, it's the, the industry standard, the market leader, if you will, in the security token space at this point. Um, but because there isn't a ton of trading volume, the, the price does you know, experience heavy fluctuations. That being said, one of the reasons why the price might be starting to rise again is because Overstock.com, not only their parent company, but a online sales business and e-commerce platform, actually announced a couple months ago that they were going to be paying a dividend to all of their shareholders that owned 10, stocks, 10 shares or more, I believe. And their shareholders that, that owned 10 shares would actually be issued a, an opportunity to participate in a digital securities offering of their Overstock.com shares. So it was a mirror one-to-one -one that the Overstock security token was, was the same value proposition with the same rights as a traditional sh public stock of Overstock.com. And so they issued that actually to investors, I think it was, it was either today or last week, a couple days ago, something like that. We've seen some volume trickle up here the last couple of days. And so now T0 is trading two security tokens. They're not just trading their own equity, but now they're trading overstock.com equity, which allows you to, to maybe determine the, the value of that equity a little bit more effectively with 10Ks and 10Qs and 8Ks that are required to be published by Overstock. So a little bit more legitimacy for T0 as they now have a second asset trading and hopefully with all of their partnerships and expansion, they can host additional assets on the exchange, which will provide more value for the T0 token price. And then to close it all out, Open Finance is the other live exchange here in the US, but unfortunately we, we've observed zero dollars in volume over the last week across all five tokens. So it doesn't seem like they're really they're not really getting much traction right now from investors. Not really sure why. We're trying to investigate kind of what, what's going on there. There, do, there are five tokens that are available to purchase, and it just seems like they're, they're kind of caught in a, a jam right now. So we'll see how that gets resolved moving forward. Finally, just to summarize it all up, we're looking at a total market cap in the security token space of live secondary traded security tokens at around $136 million. And that's a 2% or so increase from last week. So the market is holding steady. T0 certainly is the, is the main anchor to that market cap right now, with I think being around 90 million um, US dollars at this point. So they're doing a great job. And hopefully that will continue to rise the T0 equity price and grow our market cap altogether. Interesting that the market seems to be stagnating around this 130 to 150 million mark. But more interestingly, I'm looking here at the both also the overstock public stock price sitting around $20, but you have this preferred overstock token price around $30. So that's an interesting, you know, premium, third premium right there that you that you're paying right now in order to access that tokenized instrument. 
Uh, it'll be interesting again, as always, as we go over every week to see how these, these things change. We'll have to see how that, how that performs over time. I certainly know today is maybe not a great example because there was a extreme short squeeze that happened with the overstock public shares. And now we're kind of experiencing that, that bubble bursting. I think it's down 15 or 20% today because it was up, I think, 65% over the last couple of weeks. So there's been some serious fluctuations in the public stock, and that certainly is the one that carries the volume. So you're totally right. It's, it's going to be very interesting. We'll report on that every week as well, how those two are trading compared to each other. Thanks for that update, Kyle. Now let's move on to our events section, which I can tell you as always that it's the, the same lineup and October is looking like a, a fairly heavy month of, of conferences. October 3rd and 4th in Washington, D.C., we have FinTech 2020, always a, a good event. They've been around for, for a long time. You got a great list of speakers there. On October 15th and 16th, we have the Crypto Invest Summit, which has the security token track. Lots of great panels, lots of great people speaking there. And that's going to be on the 15th and 16th in LA. We also have on the 21st this month, the World Blockchain STO Summit in Dubai. And at the same time, we also have Crypto Ops 2019 in New York City. Kyle and I will be there. As always, reach out to us and we, we'd love to get on the calendar. And please submit events if you're hosting them, whether they're small or big. We love to cover activity and getting people together and locally to meet up and talk about this topic. So just to add as well, we, we don't have it, didn't have it there, but Security Token Academy is doing a New York City meetup on September 26th. So that's, that's coming right around the corner, 10 days from now, September 26th. They're doing a meetup with a, I think they're doing a couple round tables, maybe a panel. And I believe I had seen from Lindsay Stevens of Security Token Academy that they're almost past capacity. So you need to buy your tickets for that. So if you'd like to go to that, if you're in the area, go check out Security Token Academy's event as well. Nice find, Kyle. Nice find. Well, with that, I think it's time for us to move on to the main topic where we had a recent report about Dinwiddie converting his contract. For those of you who don't know, he's an NBA player for the Nets with a three-year, $34 million contract that he has announced will become a digital investment opportunity. Uh, I know you're usually the security token guy, Kyle, so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this offering. Yeah, I'm excited to, to I was really, really excited to see this piece of news. It, it's been reported in a lot of, of large scale journals and financial journals. And, and so Spencer Dinwiddie is a NBA player and he's got a three year, $30 million contract. And, in the NBA, that's fully guaranteed. So he is entitled to that money, whether he gets injured or whether he plays poorly, whatever. It's, it's fully guaranteed for him with the Brooklyn Nets. And so what his idea and what, what he is working on right now is to essentially raise money now with the promise of, of getting paid back this $34 million contract. So it really kind of becomes a fixed income deal where you've got a $34 million maturity that pays out specific coupons. I believe it's like 10.6 million this year, maybe 11.5 the following year. And then there's the third year that is actually a player option. So he can choose whether he'd like to exercise that and be paid that contract or renegotiate and start a new contract. So this is a callable bond, a two year callable or a, a three year bond with a callable option on the third year or the second year rather. And so it's essentially a straight fixed income opportunity with coupon payments and, and really what he's going to do, I'm sure, is gauge interest, gauge who's interested in, in participating and see how much money he can get up front in exchange for what interest rate he would need to pay um, at the, the conclusion of the contract. So you know your interest rate or your max interest rate could be $34 million and then we'll see how much he can raise in a lump sum up front. And so it's a really interesting idea. It's, it's certainly, it, it is something that could be very easily created and valued and, 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 uh, and we'll have to see what the interest has been in, in, in these kinds of deals before. This is not the first time that, that people have thought about conducting something along these lines. It's certainly the first time that we're leveraging a security token, which I think provides a little bit more legitimacy for this offering because there's actually a liquid market to be able to resell 
um, or exchange the, the deal. But, but Herwig, this isn't the first time, right? No, it's, it's not uh, in the past. And there have been other crowdfunding platforms that have tried to do something similar. Their most notable one is a company called Fantex, which launched around 2012, 2013, and ultimately had a bit of a different model, Kyle. Instead of investing in a specific contract, uh, which I think is uh, much easier to do than on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, here with Fantex, what you would do is you would invest in the athlete's entire future earnings. So they would typically invest... I think some of the examples they gave were for 10 or $20 million, buy 10 to 20% of the future income of that player. That includes not only their player contracts, but also the endorsements, which we know can also be a very lucrative component for athletes, especially post-season. Uh, it's so often more lucrative yeah. than the contract itself. Exactly, and, and post-retirement. So this is a, a different model. It is fascinating. They, the company went public um, and ultimately has fizzled out. So unfortunately, uh, there's not much more we can learn there as to what happened, though I do expect that blockchain technology and tokenized Securities here will dramatically improve this process, dramatically improve the experience, as well as you know create more of a liquidity component that's probably was missing for, for a lot of these things. But more importantly, there were also a lot of lost players uh, that they were able to not able to salvage, and, and something happened there that you know forced the, the company to fold. So I think that also highlights a little bit, Kyle, the hmm. importance of the being able to attract high quality products to your marketplace. In this case, they were touting themselves as the uh, stock market for uh, sports athletes. And they had signed up golfers and basketball players and football players, but ultimately have shut down. So there's definitely a lot to learn from that for anyone who is in that space. But that's why I think this deal is even more interesting because now you're talking about a specific contract you certainly would want to know what, what happens if Dinwiddie decides to go ahead and exercise the right to renegotiate. So did you just you know lose out on a, a portion of that remaining $11 million that's supposed to be paid out? Or are you going to get a portion of the new $11 million? Is he in a position then to actually be conflicted to say, well, if I take less money in this first year, but I get more money in the new deal later on, you, you might get screwed out for the investors a little bit. So just absolutely fascinating, I think, that people are going to do this. And I guess in layman terms, you know, he, he's, I guess, looking for something like how, however much you raise, but for the sake of an example, $25 million today in order to, to pay out $34 million over the next three years. And he could go and reuse that money by investing it or structuring it, or he wants to, to take advantage of having the cash all at once or investing in something big. Who knows? Um, but I think it's something that other players will look to if done successfully. And I think this could open up a whole new industry because for sure this is another one of those niche financing opportunities that people have talked about. People have tried to do it clearly. There's some activity going on, but it's certainly not something that is commonplace or even expected in the space. So this is seen as novel and new and a great way to potentially leverage security tokens as well. So it's, it's both a win for our industry as well as a win for what seems to be this new sports financing industry, which doesn't have to be limited to just players, but it could be teams. We, we've seen potential clubs uh, uh, in Europe and other teams look at tokenizing. We know the Packers, you know, I, I believe. Publicly owned. Publicly owned, right? So there is this concept of it, but it's certainly a, a new industry. So I think this is a really a great mark for both. Definitely. We've seen this wave of, of athletes starting to look at, at new financing with Russell Okun from the Chargers. I guess they're the LA Chargers now being a strong proponent of, of advocating for crypto and for moving away from traditional financing methods for athletes. And, and now Spencer Dinwiddie is considering, you know, one of these options. It's fantastic. And, and I, I like the fact that they're using an NBA contract as a pilot. It's, it's fully guaranteed, which I think is going to be important. I think that the headline athlete of the former company was Arian Foster, who was a great running back in the NFL, but his contract wasn't guaranteed. And so the, I think when I read about it, the whole deal kind of fell through after he suffered a pretty serious Achilles injury 
that ended up getting him cut from the team, and, and he wasn't entitled to a lot of the money that he was originally promised. I, I have no insider information on that actual deal, but I can imagine that certainly played a, played a part in in why that fell through. So with, a, with an NBA contract, it's fully guaranteed. You can value this like any traditional callable bond. You should be able to calculate what interest rate investors want, justify the, the price of the of the the debt instrument and, and be able to do it in a pretty straightforward manner, I'd imagine. So this is this is a super effective thing for, for athletes if you want to get your cash up front. It's just like the, you know, when you win the lottery, you can either get it in installments or you can get your lump sum and some people choose one way and some people choose the other. So uh, very interesting. We'll have to monitor. We'll certainly give you the terms whenever they come out. If we can find information on what the terms of this deal are and give you updates on, on you know, what happens moving forward if this thing actually is able to successfully raise the money? Yeah, it's really interesting, like you said earlier, that not necessarily out, you know, outside of the NBA, there isn't necessarily a fully guaranteed contract. So this could be a new way for both markets as well as players to start hedging themselves outside of those issues. Right? Yeah. You know, this could, could be that kind of a risk-reducing way to, to raise capital or sell yourself, if you will. Um, through through a digital contract, so I, I'm excited to see what other you know use cases are going to come out. We're going to see individual contracts. We might see platforms or marketplaces try to come about for the the full rights of an individual, as we saw with Fantex. And there might be some stuff in between. But the reality is, this is now becoming something that is a new investable asset class leading the way here with this digital investment. And I'm excited to to keep covering it and continuing to see other examples like this pop up left and right because previously they were not investable, they were not doable. Now, thanks to security tokens, it's a possibility. It's a possibility and you know I, I don't want to go too far and, and spend another 30 minutes talking about this, but the reality is that, that you, you can couple this opportunity and say, hey, look, I want to invest in all of the Brooklyn Nets salaries, right? So the exactly. Brooklyn Nets team could say, here's all of our contracts we have to pay out you can invest in that and, and get exposure or from the other side, the teams can, can the players rather can, can bond together and you can invest in a bunch of these contracts, distribute your risk over all of the individual players. And, and it's, it's very, very interesting. We'll have to watch Next it. thing you know, Kyle, you got fund managers putting together different portfolios of different you <laughs> of know, athletes, sports contracts endorsement and deals athletes, of, some, you know, you got an NBA batch, you've got a cross uh, platform batch for you yeah. exposed to multiple yeah. different types. Of, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's super cool. We're going to see a lot more of it for sure. We'll, of course, keep you updated. That's all we have on the topic for you today. I want to thank all of you once again for always tuning in and listening and taking the time to listen to what we have to say. As always, we ask you to join our community, participate, contribute. And last but not least, of course, please check out that letter to the SEC and, and voice your support for us. You'll be making history alongside us. And see you next week. See you later. Mm -hmm.